everyone. Um, uh, today we have Sammy Harkum here to celebrate the recent release of his book, Blood of the Virgin. Sammy Harkum is an award-winning cartoonist and editor born and raised in Los Angeles. He studied at the California Institute of the Arts and the Mayanat Institute in Jerusalem, where he created the ongoing comics anthology, Kramer's Ergo, or Ergot? Ergot. Ergot, perfect. <laughs> Considered to be one of the most influential publications of its kind. His first collection of short comic stories, Everything Together, won the 2012 Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Best Graphic Novel. Harkham's works have been published in the Best American Comics, the New York Times, Vice, and McSweeney's, among many other publications. Our conversation partner for the evening is fellow cartoonist Dash Shaw. Dash Shaw is a cartoonist, animator, and illustrator from Los Angeles as well. He attended the School of Visual Arts. He was a 2010 Sundance Labs Fellow and a 2014-2015 Coleman Center Fellow at the New York Public Library. He is also the author of Disciple, Bottomless Belly Button, Body World, and many other comics and graphic novels. Now a little bit about the book that we're here to celebrate today. Um, Blood it. Well, we don't have to do that. <laughs> no? Perfect. No, it's okay. All righty. Well, without further ado, please welcome me and joining Sammy and Dad. Thank you, Addie. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks so much for coming. Thanks, um, guys. Sammy, I, I, what were some of the first ideas for Blood of the Virgin? I think I was thinking about my parents, because my father's from Iraq and my mother's from New Zealand. And I was thinking about wanting to draw Los Angeles, because my comics up until then hadn't really... Uh, I don't think I'd ever, ever drawn like a city street or a car or a street light or anything. Like, I don't think up until that point. Um, and I was thinking about monster movies and sort of merging those three together. Like there was something that felt... in the title, this weird title just kept sort of repeating in my head that seemed to reference many things at once. So it started as I was doing Kramer's Ergot 8, and I thought I would just do it as like a three-pager, because the page limit with that was three pages per cartoonist, max. Three pages was the max. So I thought I'd try to do it as a three-pager, and then it just started to grow. It was one of those ideas where it just kept suggesting more and more. So that's what that was. And the the can can you say a bit about the 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 filmmaker in the center of it, Seymour? Seymour is I guess a, is a Middle Eastern Jewish guy in his mid twenties, and he's a film editor. He's not even a film editor. He's a trailer editor. So his job is just to cut the trailers for movies. And he's one of these people that's just trying to get a lot of things going at once, at all times. And he's uh, quite immature in many ways. And the horror movies that you're kind of focusing on, these, these uh, exploitation-y type movies, it feels like part of it is people at this time who are forced to work in this genre that they didn't give a shit about. Right. And then they had to fit their personal vision inside of that. And so do you see a relationship between that and like the EC comics of the time or comics or... Um, and then also like even when you were saying like you had to fit it into these to the three pages uh -huh. something about um, the uh, the uh, well, well, no, forget the three pages thing Go ahead. well it's just um, I, I think it was an interesting moment in time in that like it was before genre films and uh, um, it didn't have the sort of respectability that would come later in the 70s. So most people who are doing genre movies or working in, in, in exploitation cinema at that time didn't want to be there. You know, they, they all want to be elsewhere. But I thought it would be interesting to have a guy who's too late in some ways, like he's kind of past the moment of that. It's sort of that post-60s moment in 71, and but he's also too early. Because it's more like in 78, 77 that like the the real, what they call the, the horror kids of the 50s, like Spielberg and Joe Dante start making movies. So I like that he was sort of like in this in weird that. pocket of time. And then, yes, there is a relationship to comics there. And that like, I, obviously it was very natural to write a character who's really passionate about this stuff that nobody cares about. 
at least in like in, as anything more than um, uh, except in a financial way, you know. And then to connect it to your previous question about the character is that he's like a very there's an innate tension be, when you have a character who's <clears throat> all his principles and all his values are in direct conflict with the medium that he's working in or the industry that he's working in. Like everything that means everything, like everything that is important to him while making a film are all the things that are not important and vice versa. So, you know, like to the people hiring him, to the people hiring him who want just something to be made on time, Mm -hmm. on budget and to be done. And he's bringing all this other stuff to it. You know, and he's also unbending. I don't think there's a scene in the book where he laughs. I don't think he smiles. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, I kept thinking if he was going to laugh, he'd have, like, a big, honking horse laugh. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like, you'd be like, oh, my God. Like, this guy should, you don't want him to laugh. Like, it's weird. Like, it's something that just comes out in this really gross way. But I never got to do that scene because it never came up. So the artists that are that had to exist inside of those restrictions in films and comics... Kind of, but now you you have no restrictions. You know, crickets, crickets is like only whatever you want. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. Do you, do you have thoughts about that? Not really. No. <laughs> I, I can't I guess, think of anything. I it's guess not sparking the, anything. I mean, the, uh, the, it's a different world. I mean, the the I think I, even even before slightly before people our age, mm-hmm. maybe it would be like. Well, it should come out monthly and it should be funny or there should be there would be some expectation. And the thing that I find a, kind of difficult with with like a one artist anthology series that Blood of the Virgin was um, serialized in is I was like, the expectation seems like to be just the the be- the coolest thing. You know, mm-hmm. it's not like, oh, I'm getting, um, you know, um, a Scooby-Doo comic and I want a Scooby-Doo story and oh it happens to actually also be this other thing that's really so there's like a surprising element of it kind of being more than what is expected mm. so how do you is is there an expectation that you're thinking about that I'm not aware of or or you like that there's no expectation you know no the uh, expect I think it comes out of all the comics that I liked reading that were single issue comics where you could you could tell that the person who made it was putting sort of everything they had into it and, mm-hmm. and putting in a lot of work and just it was you know because if you're doing a comic book that's 48 pages it's going to take you you know at least a year maybe a couple of years so it becomes like um, you're trying to contribute to the sea of comics that you know, cr- cricket starts 2006, 2007. So everything up from like, you know, from uh, Crumb doing his solo books and then the other undergrounds and then really the 90s cartoonists, you know, they sort of showed a way forward where this was. And I always thought like that was the goal, just to try to make something that was a great comic book that you didn't need to wait till the next issue for it to be satisfying. You know, like I wanted the whole thing. So Blood of the Virgin is designed so that each chapter, if you haven't read the previous one, or if you're not going to read the next one, uh, would still kind of work. It didn't, Mm -hmm. I mean, by the time I got to the last chapter, that was basically impossible. But um, throughout the rest of the series, that's what I was trying to do. The expectation is a, a great comic from Sammy. As good as I can do well, it. Well, yeah, you know? I mean, I'm not, that's you know. That's the goal. No, that's the goal. Not, it you're... shouldn't be like, oh, an okay, Sammy comic, you know. No, you're because <laughs> you're like, if you're rushing, who are you rushing for? You're not, there's no, you're not being given an advance. You're not, you don't have a readership. You don't, what's, the, why would you rush? You know, if you're rushing mm-hmm. just to get it done, it doesn't seem like, I don't know who that's for, the mm-hmm. rushed comic, you know. You got to find a system that keeps you moving forward. So you aren't spending years on a single page, but you also need to like uh, bring everything to it. And if you find the right story, a plot is just like a coat hanger, right? Mm-hmm. It's this like, like this very basic uh, armature that then you put ideas on top of. And as long as this, as long as that plot keeps suggesting ideas, then I'm good to go, you know. 
And then occasionally you'd have an idea that you would sit on for like a year or something thinking, oh, I think when we get to that scene, I'll be able to do this. And you'd get there and you'd realize like, oh, comics aren't actually made to convey this idea visually. Well, oh, I'd love an example of that. For an example, there's a scene where I wanted someone to see a, um, a lipstick uh, stain on their uh, sleeve. Mm-hmm. And they, of, of some of their own lipstick. On their, no, no, of someone else's on mm-hmm. them. And they want to roll up their sleeve or Oh, because it's thing. ink. It's black. It's just ink. like it just doesn't. It didn't have any sort of. The See, that's when you write it. lipstick stain. <laughs> as like the it. Yeah, that's what I would do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do that as much as I can, which I think uh. comes from Peter Bag, who did those junior comics for. Like, like labels. Yeah, like mean? someone would be like um, at doing their dishes, and it would be like scrub, 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 mm. and then you know shampoo, shampoo, shampoo when they're in the shower. Yeah, you're then, wondering it's it's. Sort and of I always a... try to I do that as much as possible. Johnny Ryan does it in Prison Pit. Yeah. As we were talking earlier. Um, to me, anything I'm... that's going to help the reader and me... is it helping them, or is it a sound? <laughs> It's not a sound. It's not a sound. It's, it's not a, obviously it's not a well, sound. Well, like lipstick stain is helping them, but I don't. You know, if you can draw shampoo. No, bubbles, you would. I, I wouldn't. It wasn't the kind of scene where if you wrote mm-hmm. lipstick and had a little arrow. Mm-hmm. Some comics can do it, but tonally it wasn't what I had in mind. Not. But it's okay. Not a rich, Richard Scary moment. You end up, and then that what I end up doing instead was. You know, you're like, what conveys that idea? What? How do I do mm-hmm. this? You know, and so what? What you end up coming up with is innately um, a comic book idea. Like it looks good as comics, it feels good as comics, um, and it's much richer. I mean, that's you know, that's why I don't really, you know, I don't write scripts for that reason. I don't want to adapt something from one mm-hmm. medium to another. Um, I told you my favorite scene in the comic is when Seymour is eating this hot dog and thinking about his child being born. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, they're outside and, and, well, could you tell me, I don't know, could you uh, tell me how you came? That scene? Yeah, yeah. What? Gosh, I felt like, um, I think in that scene, it gave me the opportunity <laughs> to draw this uh, hot dog counter. That I like uh-huh. from this movie, Minnie and Moskowitz. There's this really great coffee, uh, sorry, this hot dog stand in that movie where they have a scene, and behind them was this old Hollywood uh, supermarket. There were some things, so I was like, oh, this is all interesting stuff. And then. The location always seems like it's pretty first for you. Location's a big one. And then I think the, the, the thing that he's thinking about, which is the birth of the kid, it's probably just like. That was issue two. I drew it in 2014. My kid was six, and I mm. had another one. But I think I was still just in the throes of fatherhood th- stuff. And, like, it always... I think Adula said to us, like, said that line that's in the thing where she's like, two people are going to walk into a room, and <laughs> three people are going to come out. Mm-hmm. You know? And she was just, like, preparing us. And I was like, that is such I a think trippy the thing, idea. I think the thing I like about it is it felt very casually done and like a thought that would creep it felt like i know it didn't happen this way but it felt like oh you kind of had these scene and then like oh maybe he starts thinking about this thing while this other thing is happening while people it didn't feel like the the text image pairing like i wasn't going to try to puzzle out the relationship between birth and this hot dog or something it right, didn't right, feel right, like right, it was right. no the joy felt, is like if you can get if you can have some interesting dialogue and then visually they're doing something. So if he's eating the whole hot dog over mm-hmm. 12 panels, and then she's starting a salad, and she's got a cigarette in the scene, I think, too, and then she puts it in the salad, because mm-hmm. she orders a salad at a hot dog stand, which is like a bad idea, which she thinks about. Mm-hmm. And then also I like that they're not, he's having this whole thought thing, but he's not sharing it with her. Yeah, I also really all, like that. Right? Because you know in their he, relationship. Her, like, why would you you know in their relationship that maybe that would have been nice for him to do. Yeah. Oh. Probably. But it makes the scene better. So it's just all these things together. And then you're like, okay, I think I got a page and a half of comics. That'll keep me busy for the next week and a half or two weeks or whatever mm-hmm. it was at that time, you know? Um, at that time, it was about, a, I was trying to do a page a week. And then. As it went on, it was two pages a week. When you were Good doing, to know. 
Well, I'm just trying to think. Like when you're working yeah, on yeah. the scene, it's like they're not done quickly, so you have time to really think about them, think about all that stuff. You know, it was hard to draw the hot dog, is what I remember. It's hard to draw. Mm, yeah, yeah. Someone People holding eating a hot it. dog. Yeah, and yeah. Eating it. It's like yeah. A weird. It's actually it's hard to do. The, hand, the little Lego kind of hand. <laughs> um, the uh, the. All right, I have kind of a confrontational question. That's fine. <laughs> We're amongst um, friends. So it's all good. L A. L A. Things about making movies. Mm-hmm. I find I know, like it's, it's give, like. Uh, I feel like it's it, it feels like propaganda coming from emanating from this town to the rest of the world. We're so interesting. Right. We make, you know, we make and it's like movies don't even originate there. They just get to decide this so I guess am I wrong? Well, help help me understand. No, I definitely felt like it's kind of a shame that it's an LA story and it's a movie story. It, it is in the sense that it would be great to do something in Los Angeles that has nothing to do with the film world because the city there is so big. There's so many neighborhoods, there's so many worlds and we could only barely suggest it. The plot only allowed it so that I could sort of have those things sort of edging in on the corners because I agree with you. It's like, who wants a book about LA that's also a book about movies? But sadly, that's where I'm from. And the movies was a great, um, it was a great entry point. What's up, Kevin? But I want to a later point in the book. It sh- sh- that's oh, true, yes, I forgot yes, about that. Yes, you leave. So maybe yeah, but, you decided to leave. No, no, what's, what were you saying? At what point did you decide, like, let's, was that always the plan? It let's was, because the basic since we're amongst friends we can just we can pull the the curtain back a large part of this like the basic narrative of the whole thing even though it took a million years to do was my dad who did not work in film you know and came to los angeles with a small child and and his wife and they were like real bumpkins with nothing and as he's talking about like trying to just like make a buck Mm -hmm. you know my mom is saying like they're divorced and so my mom's like like was at this dinner and she's just like she's like oh it was a nightmare the whole thing was a nightmare and he's like it was amazing it was amazing and then i met this guy and then i did this and i you know it's like doing this thing and then he's like and then she's like yeah i left and i was like you left and she's like yeah i went to new zealand and i'm like mm. how long she's like i just left like i wasn't com- she wasn't I said planning I was on visit. coming back yeah she's like i was vi- i said i was gonna visit and then i just stayed and then he had mm. to come get her. And I'm like, you went back? Mm-hmm. Like, and I, So just that was enough of a plot of something mm-hmm. that could be just a short story or something. So that gave it between the movie plot, because mm-hmm. the pre-production, shooting, and post. I was like, well, there's three parts. And then they're together. She leaves. He brings her back. Mm-hmm. So it automatically opened it up. Um, and then I and think again, the, it's uh, well. Keep going. No, I was just gonna say, like, I wasn't mapping any of this stuff out, and I just think your subconscious is doing the work for you. Like, it's it's it, there's things planted early that my brain is automatically mm. pulling from later on. So that the, when she goes to, so when I think when the when we switch to New Zealand, the reader is actually like you can't do it all the time. Where suddenly you're just gonna be in a completely new setting with and meet all new characters this far along in a book. But it just felt very natural, and it felt like something you could do in a novel as opposed to a TV show or something, like or a movie, which I liked. I liked that it felt, despite it being about movies, it's not like a, it doesn't have a movie structure. It's something um, else. You, know? you, I think you t- on the car drive over, you told a great uh-huh. story that I feel like points at when your cartooning is best. It feels like it emerges out of a very intuitive drawing place mm-hmm. where you're like. This guy is, you're like, this shape is, is, you had a story with someone walking their dog, and I'm probably going to tell it wrong, but. Tell it. The, I can't remember it. The, you're like, this shape is walking a dog, and he's thinking of an idea, or maybe it's a woman, I don't know, you're drawing, and you're like, you draw this little circle oh, on right, the head. Right, and you're right, like, oh, right, wait, right. it's an afro or something. What is this? And then you're like, oh, no, it's Jim Davis. Right. Um, and the dog <laughs> is Garfield. Right. And he's thinking of a Garfield coming. And I thought, this is amazing, because that's, that's a that great way. idea, and it's like it actually came from your hand. 
making these shapes the and you're like oh what that. what well because you're so um i mean everyone here's probably a cartoonist so they know like you're you can have the all the ideas in the world of for something but you really are you have to work with your if you're, your instruments like if you have a guitar like one instrument like you can't be thinking in terms of a of an orchestra right so i have i can have ideas but it's literally like what can this stupid hand actually <laughs> You know, and it make. becomes a story idea. <laughs> yeah, it becomes yeah. And the story emerges from that, and then ideas emerge from that. You know, and, and the, the characters are developed on the page as well. So most stories, and you know this, the first chapter, not the first chapter, but most of these things, most chapters, I'll start drawing a sequence that's not. I don't draw an order, so I'll do a sequence that's usually wordless that I'm very excited about. But and when I and when you do a wordless sequence. Or there's minimal words. You don't need to know everything about the characters. You just need to know the basic dynamics between them. And then as you spend the months drawing the whatever, couple pages it takes, you're learning how to draw it. They're figuring the characters are coming more and more complex and real. And so it's through the act of that. So then the, the scene, specificity of it. Yeah, like it's so and, and every character in that book I think initially you could look you could look at it and be like, oh, it's just a type. It's like a type. Here's a type. Here's like the annoying wife. Or like here's a biker. Here's the snooty producer. Here's and then, you know, you you, you know you want to push it beyond that, but actually drawing them, they become very, very nuanced. And then you just go like, if the story allows it, I'll expose more of them. Like we'll see all that, you know? Mm -hmm. And if the story doesn't you know, then you're just going to get a glimmer of it. So in chapter, the one in New Zealand, there's a lot of like references to various things where I was like, we might go to the dog races. And I've, mm. I've sort of talked about that here. And then there's all this stuff with the sister and this other biker. There's all these things. And I think it all works fine because it's still the main, the plot's moving. So I don't want to go off. It's not the kind of story where you can just go off on totally unconnected tangents, you know? And at least it suggests that these characters have a more bigger world. Did did you know? did the color p there? I mean, I don't There's know if people have seen the color chapter and the and the Budapest chapter. Did they kind of sep arrive? Did they grow out of the main thrust, or were they? I don't. I mean, yeah, the you Budapest take like a thing, couple a couple big detours. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just felt like at some point when working on this you realize that the age of the characters would make it so that they were born in 1946. So if they're born in 46, and one of them is from Eastern Europe, mm. then that means her parents were in the Holocaust. So it's like no option. Like they mm. definitively were involved in something. And I thought how, and every person you meet who was born in that era, mm -hmm. like I have a lot of friends whose parents, my wife's parents, all their grandparents, mm -hmm. And their kids, their, sorry, the children of the survivors are nuts. <laughs> like, they have serious, like, and I, I've read a lot of studies on it. Like, a, a, a lot of um, medical, interesting essays on this, like, medical stuff, where they basically said, like, parents would have a tendency to either smother their children, like, excessively smother them, mm -hmm. or do the exact opposite and, like, have shown no mm -hmm. emotion. You know, depending on how they went through the war. And I just thought, like, this is such a big part of this mm. generation. It would be great to throw it in there. And I read Martin Amos's book, Time's Arrow, which is mm. a really interesting book. Have you read it? No, I, I have it's it. Really I don't cool. want it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really cool book. Basically, it tells the story of... It's, 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 a, it's a story told from the perspective of a soul that lives inside the body of an SS officer, but it's, it's, it's experiences, it experiences life backwards, but doesn't mm. know it. So I liked how it was about um, our limited perception as physical beings of what we think is reality and what we think is, so the, this- It's narrated by the soul? It's narrated oh. by the soul. And so it says like, oh, our job is we take smoke, smoke comes down, and then we dig the ground, and then people come out mm -hmm. of the ground. like. Talking about the, sorry, the smoke, and then we uh, take CMD these bodies. of the counterclockwise world. He does this Tokyo. thing where it's like, he'll say, yeah, our job, we went to this place, and our job was to take smoke and then open these ovens 
and then take these mm. bodies out, and then we put clothes on them, and then we put them on a train, you know, and then we close the door and they go. And so it's very positive. So it's from the so it's a very positive like perspective on this very dark stuff. And I like the rhythm of it. Had this really like like clockwork kind of rhythm, and that felt like a comic, like something. So that wait, would wait, have wait, a wait, wait. But how did oh uh, well keep how well, did saying, it so tie the, in? Yeah. So I felt like oh that was really interesting because it has a certain energy, and I was like, there's that. And then Roddy Doyle did a story, a short story, where the whole story took place where he did this thing where the first paragraph of maybe a five-page story, the first paragraph covered the first 40 years of a, of a marriage, right? Of how they met and everything, like, really quickly. And then the rest of the story was, like, this guy looking at his wife while she was, sweep, was sleeping. So mm, it was like, yeah, it was yeah. Like, and I was like, wow, you can do, like, really... Int-, and I was like, oh, we could do that. And I was like, mm. this way I can introduce it, and if I can do it in as narrow a, a space as possible then that'll dictate the length of the rest of the chapter because it can't be half it can't be a fourth even you want it to be so once that i condensed that whole opening thing and, to like and 13, making it pages, no and I was dialogue like, well, helps condense it yeah and then know. it was also that that idea of the clock so it's it's gridded and i show the same actions four times so you see the actions yeah, like the factory whistle right so you see it you see it you see like a day in the life before the war Mm. during uh at the camps and then after and i was like this is a good way and because i just finished the color chapter where every every page was weeks of work and research Mm. and stuff because it was drawing 1917 to 1960 this chapter i was like except for what's historical i didn't look at anything because I was like, the reader also just want, like, I think we can totally just, it can be simple. So it's really just these, fig- like, it's not, there's no, it's not, there isn't a lot of filigree. It's very, very simple. And I thought, like, that was also, like, every time you finish a sequence or a page, the next, like, it suggests the rhythm of the next one and what you can introduce and what you can let go of. I'm sure you... The, you know, um... Think really page by page for you not like a scene by scene i mean you're, you're... a scene is like you know yeah it is page by page because this that will dictate even if it's a sequence if you have let's say two people and it's very dense talking and you're like oh i want to i can open this up you're mm-hmm. like, actually i want to open it up even more actually you know maybe i mean the funny like the book has one double page this, spread yeah but yeah like, but it earns that to me that it's like this there's this calibration of space time um, you know and the amount of panels are, are, so if you, yeah. do, if you do like a large panel it feels no, like no. something and then yeah. a double page spread is like that's like a big um uh <laughs> this makes me think i should have asked you this before but yeah. this makes me think i heard someone <laughs> a mutual friend say that one time you were talking and you were like you were like after this, you're annoyed already. No, I'm not. I'm just you're like, which mutual friend are, is throwing me under well, the it's bus. Frank, but <laughs> I didn't. And then people don't know Frank. The, know um, the, there was like two. You're like, all right, I've had two pages of like a bunch of panels on each page. And so I've earned the right to do like a big single panel. And you said that. No, he's wrong. Oh. I well, right, this is miss, miss, but that was kind of like what you were just no, saying. No, if this, if the, because I thought that well, makes wait, it feel. Wait. Yeah, go ahead. I thought no, like a. I thought we were talking about it. We were just like, I feel like it's the opposite. That like, if you get a big thing in there, then they could kind of get invest and want to decode this little thing. It, it the details oh, yeah, don't yeah, matter, yeah. but the point is that you definitely don't go because I've drawn this much, these many panels. I'm allowed to do it. It's more like the rhythm of the. Whatever yeah, the emotional yeah, yeah, yeah. rhythm of the scene, and got, yeah. and if you can, if you're just track, <laughs> no, no, if you're if you're just tracking the emotion of the scene, mm-hmm. then, you know that I think the biggest challenge, is that probably for every cartoonist is that you get so deep, into the nuance of it, that you think that the slightest, change in calibration, is going to be noticed by the reader, right? And they might, but you're also looking at. It's like someone like you ever taken a you ever taken a hearing test? You take a hearing test and you're in the booth and you put it on. And it's like and they say raise your finger if you hear it if you hear a buzz, 
and it's so subtle. It's like so, and so with the comics, you know, like you think like, oh man, I made the panel this much wider for this one, <laughs> and so now um, they know that like there's a certain amount of breathing room, but it's a hmm. little. And I'm also working within a limited. I'm always setting the page count pretty early on. So then at a certain point, you're like, I've got six pages mm -hmm. to make all this work. I like those constrictions. So yeah, I like yeah. one pagers. Like mm -hmm. every one pager, I feel like I could make a 10 page thing, but by condensing it, you really figure out how you can stack information um, and convey everything that you want in that small space. So I, Frank makes it sound like it's like more fun. It's not that fun. <laughs> to do, I mean, to do the big panel. To do the big yeah, panels yeah, yeah, right. are like it's great yeah, when yeah. it happens, but you know if you're well, lucky, it made me just think of of just uh, that. I, I don't know. There's a page in the, Blood of the Virgin where two people are have are like having beers at a, on a car, and mm -hmm. they rest their heads on the hood of the car, mm -hmm. and the way it was designed, like. They're just looking at each other. So it was just back and forth. Mm -hmm. And that was maybe the only page where I was like, oh, wow, I can literally like sit here. I can pencil this whole page before before lunch. Mm. You know what I mean? And I was like, I probably was talking to Kevin at the time. I was like, I could ink this and I could do a whole page in a day. But I'm like, it feels totally wrong. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, I eat, And if you're lucky to get a scene that's easy to do, there's also a, one page of a car Drifting into nothingness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You're like, oh. But that's so far, you know, out of 15 years, is like two two instances. One, but it's okay. There's other joys of doing this work. One uh, one panel that I sticks out in my mind is um, she's uh, walking her child mm. or something, and there's this really d um, intricately drawn tree <laughs> breaking through the roots breaking yeah. through the sidewalk and i was like man sammy was just in love with this tree or <laughs> was this an actual tree or is it like are these just it kind of look like it's a new zealand it's the kind of thing it's where with the picket fence you see it you, in like hawaii too there's certain places where like in tropical or like weird where, where the weather is very extreme or weird, you'll you'll because I because she's walking like towards it with yeah. on the uh, with the baby carriage and I'm like oh so the wheels are gonna have to go over that thing yeah. is she gonna go around, kind of became like the, um, did that, that yeah, I guess well well so that was creating the place again and and uh, it yeah, wasn't it was, it it was it, like if I I wanted to establish that we were in New Zealand without having to use I, sometimes oh, there's yeah, title yeah, yeah, yeah. things. For some reason, like one of them says Palm Springs, it just felt right to write. Mm -hmm. They're now in Palm Springs. I just because it, I think because it looks uh, optimistic. Like yeah, Palm yeah, Springs. yeah, but, yeah. Like you know what I mean? But like but it's, it's a little a ironic. Yeah, like yeah. Palm Springs, and it's shitty. But I didn't want to because we had already had a thing that said uh, Budapest. Yeah, you should have written that like how you wrote Palm Springs. There you go. <laughs> no. <Budapest>. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it was it was trying to like very quickly try to show the reader that we were now in another country. Uh huh. We weren't in L.A. She yeah, wasn't yeah, back yeah, in L.A. Yeah. For anyone who was tracking it, I mean, at that point, who knows what the reader's thinking, having to follow this thing for so long. But I thought the park—that's a very like, you know, New Zealand in 1971 would be more like England in 1955. So mm -hmm. all the cars are older. People's fashion and style is more like the 60s, or if they're older. Again, like, and you know, there's things that just you don't get to fit in. But there, but like that park, it has like a statue of like a Captain Cook type guy, hmm. and, and the park is really well maintained. And the and the buildings you can see around it are much more like of England, because New Zealand and Australia, anything that's part of the British Commonwealth, they they look like British outposts in many ways. So yeah, but the tree, yeah, it was cool to draw the tree. I don't know. Um, I don't. Should we take some questions from the audience? If, yeah, we've been talking for like twenty minutes, twenty-five minutes. So yeah, if there are any questions, we're happy. Hi. Uh, hey, uh, thanks for being here. Um, I had a question about a specific line that really stuck out when I was uh, rereading um, the whole thing together. Mm. Different issues and things. But um, the I think it's Val um, says to Seymour that really cool thing about oh you'll have another kid and then break up. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that line because to me, I interpret it as like one of those things that somebody just tosses <clears> off about your whole being. That even if it's not true, it's still just like, damn, like 
That was brutal. Well, you like you wonder, is it true? Is it true? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, is it true? Yeah. 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 No. So someone had said that to me, so I could use it. Um, Jesus. And when you're younger, if you're younger and so, like you know, you're so uncertain of, you know, you know, I don't know. At least me in my twenties, and maybe even in my thirties, but definitely in my twenties, I felt very like discombobulated mm -hmm. as far as like what's going to happen, what's going to happen next, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So um, it seemed like a good line to throw in there. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, on the flip side, the people who say stuff like that, that's how they live their life. They're very, like, flippant. And so he, that character's kind of like that throughout the whole book, so it, it fit, you know? And I don't think, you know, you don't, I don't start the page thinking that's going to go in there. It's like you're working on what, whatever the exposition and whatever you need, and, you know, you just pull from the well of whatever. One, you know, one thing, when I, when I read your comics, I can... Your characters really will go at each other, you do know? They, do they argue and stuff? From my perspective, but you know, I was raised in like a very like no right. raised voices right. place. That's nice. Um, and I feel like that, that oh, oh, like Sammy is in this world where people really can Can you talk, talk a little bit? I think, you know, you got to understand that when you started publishing comics, we were like, he's a Quaker. Yeah. And so oh. I imagine like someone like out on a farm making comics so can no, you no, just no. definitively now that this is being recorded definitively tell us what your religious right, yeah. uh childhood was like and your, your no they, i think you're you were thinking of probably they were thinking of amish people right but you know present many present day quakers but it, it i also had very older parents you, uh, did. you know they you know they're older than me but you know they're <laughs> older than other people my age I felt that need clar clarifying. The, the, uh, uh, so, you know, it was like, it was sitting in silence. No, I don't remember many arguments. And that's what I think Did part of what the Quaker, we, yeah, we'd go church? to a Quaker meeting and, and it was, but part of the thing that was interesting is disagreements in the meeting house because part of Quakers is, um, it, all, it was absolute consensus decision making inside yeah. the meeting house, no voting. Amazing. Um, so there would be something like we want, they wanted, um, it's hard and it maybe it'd be like 20 people, very small, but it's hard to get 20 people to agree on anything. Yeah. Um, so it would be very long, slow deliberation on if there would be, um, a water fountain installed on the second floor of the building. Right. And um, but I think on. that, yeah, uh, no, sorry. Uh, but I think that, that, um, that, the relationships that the characters have in your movie with each other, I I feel like it's also in the drawing and in kind of the personality of the page where I even like your little side, um, the back back covers of the comics would be you drawing and it's like you like fucking angry like <laughs> like. You know, cra funny. Uh, crashing on this funny. thing. No, no, it, and it's, it's part of like, uh, I don't know how it's real part of like a, a goofy. Um, you know, I'm, I don't mean to psychoanalyze you on this. No, I think look, I think all I think, I mean, I think everyone here knows that the, that a good comic or any cartoonist that's really working unselfconsciously is going to end up revealing so much of their personality just the way they draw faces yeah you know yeah what i mean like and that's a beautiful that, thing about the medium is that it's you're getting you're getting something that's very very pure and and actually unguarded and and un and you know it's very unintentional yeah yeah you know what i mean yeah I can. and i love that to me is like what makes it the greatest medium of all that's what makes it so incredible is that it, it's something so humble and direct and very pure, you know. That's like when people do it right. It's fantastic. It's I'm I'm you know someone said about Jaime Hernandez. It's like you can tell he grew up in a big family because there was like so many people are fit in each panel. Always like other larger. people can't yeah. can only fit one or two people in a panel. He can fit. And you mentioned so your father was a comics fan. Was, yeah. Were there other people in the community who were into comics? Well, okay, I, you know, the Quaker, it, it wasn't like a Quaker commune or something. It was the, 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 uh, but my dad was really, 
he had a it, it sounds like the perfect situation it sounds like i'm making it up but the he had a box of underground comics that was in this crawl space between my bedroom and the parents bedroom so you'd crawl in and you'd read these things and you're like what the hell is this this is are these sexy comics he um he had uh frank miller he loved will eisner and um he, so very early i had a very big i knew lots of com i had a great comics education very early and there was no and then sorry go ahead uh and then i was the right age where all the manga comics were coming out and that felt new and it was like oh and i, and I remember seeing like you know, a 300 page comic about soccer or something. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know. It was like comics can be anything. Mm. And then when I saw art comics or Gary Panner, it was, the lesson was the same. It was like comics can be anything. They don't even have to look like comics. Mm. That's what I remember from Gary Panner. It's like, because mm -hmm. the comics before always kind of looked like comics. Um, and uh, the, then he, but, yeah, very early I had it. It sounds like you you grew up in a similar. But for you, but I, no also books. I've heard you no talk. Books. It was kind of connect. What say it again? There were no books in the house. Oh, I thought you said you grew up around a lot of like. I was lucky. Um, I had an older. I had two older. I had oh, two yeah, older brothers. Right. I come from like a very like Jaime. So many people in the family, huge mm. extended family. So there was always tons of people around. But my brother liked comics. So, you know reading all kinds of stuff and the comic shop you know in 1986 when i'm six years old it's like when bill sankevich is doing like electra assassin and it's like it's all that post dark night stuff that's like scary mm -hmm. like new universe there was like a new universe yeah, yeah, poster yeah, yeah. mobius was doing these very scary posters you know so all these comics were like to me it, it was transgressive yeah was yeah you said to me. that and you connected to um horror movies and yeah. schlocky like culture punk and, music yeah yeah and comic yeah. books seemed like together mm -hmm. all that stuff just seemed of a piece so yeah are there any other questions okay great yeah i have a feeling that you, this, the answer might be repeating things that you no, said it's before, okay but i found that focusing on the, the movie side of the plotting i found myself wondering reading it this afternoon if uh, as far as what happens in terms of uh, Seymour's placement uh, in, in his business throughout the story. Was uh -huh. that based on anything you had researched, or was that more character? Even? There were a couple things. There was a movie There was a movie called Messiah of Evil, which I really like, made by uh, Gloria Katz and William Hayek in 72, 73. But they have this story where, like, they were shooting the end, they were getting ready to shoot the end of the movie, and the people who would were funding this or funding the distribution company that hired them uh, decided to retile their roof instead of keep paying for the movie. <laughs> yeah. So the movie's like amazing and they're trying to make do and it's, it's a fascinating movie for many reasons. But like that's one because I think I still, I just, I just totally just used that where like he's trying to shoot and they're like, oh, this is done now. Like we're done. And then um, his trajectory you know, the good version would be Peter Bogdanovich. So in like 60, a little earlier, he had to take footage from a Boris Karloff movie and he made Targets, which is really great. And then uh, Joe Dante, a couple years later, like in 75, took a bunch of footage uh, and shot a little, it was like, used a lot of footage that the company had at Corman mm -hmm. and he made something called Hollywood Boulevard. Um, but yeah, that's the usual thing. And Joe Dante, I met him somewhere when I was starting the project, and he gave me his phone number. And, and so, because, you know, there's no interviews about, like, where was the editing rooms for Corman. I mean, even though the, in the comic it's a different kind of company, it was like, he was really useful in that it was like, I could ask him really generic, like, really specific, mundane things. Like, what were the body, like, did, did you have any, like, like what were the physical problems of editing all day? Where was the editing space compared to where the offices were? How many keys were there? Like how many people worked in there? You know, and so all that, like one long, really long in-depth conversation. And I felt like, oh, I totally, I could, I could figure it out enough. And then I went back to, I went to school at CalArts. 
so I had uh, an MFA student like walk me through um, some editing, which I had done in school, but it was really useful to do it just for the comic, take a million photos, really just, you know, because you want to like, with anything like this, I'm sure you've experienced this probably with discipline, where you want to get past any sense of nostalgia, any sense of romanticism, yeah. but comics deals in like really clear tropes. You know what I mean? So like if you have a hippie, like you think of like uh, an Archie hippie, like bell bottoms, headband, <laughs> long hair, John Lennon glasses, you know? And you're like, how do I somehow make this very readable but also feel nuanced? So it's not just this like generic thing or this idea that it's like a love letter like god forbid you know like mm -hmm. you want it just to be like you want it to feel as real as now so you the more you can just sort of live in it and really get a sense of it the better off you are i think so you as know? far as like research of the filmmaking industry stuff mm. was there's a book called nightmare nightmare usa by stephen thrower which is to, sort of tells an alternate history of uh, horror films, like whereas the usual history is there's Night, Night of the Living Dead, and then Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and then The Exorcist, right? This is like this, that's the shape. But this whole book, it's an amazing book. He's a very interesting guy. His whole thing is let's look at that trajectory from like regional, low budget cinema, and he has this beautiful thought, which you don't see so much in film, in film criticism. But it, they, like if a painter makes a mistake when painting and they include the mistake, everyone's like, wow, you know, it's incorporated into the work. And everyone goes like, well, he's still, he, any sort of genius that that artist might have isn't denied because it's a mistake. Whereas if you watch a cheap horror film made by someone who's never made one <laughs> and they're making it in a small town and they're making it with their family, if it has any sort of resonance and power, Critics are often willing to just to just 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 sort of throw that aside and be like, oh, they didn't mean to. Like all those things are by accident. But you're like, well, they're beautiful. They're beautiful mm -hmm. things. So thinking about that and just get, trying to get past, just trying to get past the that romantic notion of like there are these five things, which you see in every sort of medium, right? Yeah. It's like the history of any medium is always like these these big points of reference that everyone has, and it's nice to sort of go past that. And just be like, no, there's there's all this other stuff that that stuff is built on top of. That's a long answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that, you made me wonder, do mistakes ever factor in either in writing or drawing <coughs> when you're doing something that's kind Probably. of personal? Probably. I, I can't think of anything specific, but I think all of it feels like mistakes. That might be. <laughs> that's what my first thought was. <laughs> what? I was like, it was all it's a all mistake. But did but you I feel that with discipline? That. Did you feel when you were doing discipline that like this whole setting, like a war comic and everything, like did you feel like you know you had to find a way past to sit looking like um, little dolls in costumes or whatever? Um, no, it was really uh, you know the first thing was the Quaker thing more like okay I know like those rooms and the meeting houses mm -hmm. and this and then when it, i thought juxtaposing that with this totally insane uh war felt i didn't do anything i didn't work on it because i thought i can't draw that that would be mm. I, I don't know how to do that mm. and then the the met had a civil war art exhibit that i went to and uh all of the the paintings and drawings were very sm this is sounds dumb but it mm. shows maybe how i was thinking the work was very small. It was mm -hmm. small scale. Mm -hmm. They weren't like giant David paintings. And uh, and then you think, oh, the Civil War, it's, you think of like miniatures. And you're like, oh, the Civil War is small. And on a scale. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's huge. Uh, uh, and then I thought, well, uh, I, something, that just made it more doable. Mm. That's right. the could, stupidest you could, you reason. Could, no, but, you can, but whatever. You need these it, mental uh, tricks to be able to tackle and then, um, um And then... Uh, you know, Quakers wrote in this totally crazy way. They still said, like, thee and thou and all of this stuff that was d different than others at the time. So then that was exciting. And I was like, oh, if, uh, you know, there were enough other things that made it, like, doable. But the whole thing felt like a bad idea. Right, yeah. right. I mean, for every uh, every possible reason. Sure. But sure. Um, 
Yeah, I think you had. Oh, uh, it's probably a question more directed to Sammy, but uh, you know, between like doing you know, Kramer's family, all the theater stuff, you know, it's like a lot of, and then can, keeping up like a consistent practice during that entire period. How do you feel like kind of curating these kind of like big things involving a lot of artists and trying to keep consistency in your own book? Is that like a challenge? It or? would. It would usually be like um, three months on you know of like really intense comics work and sort of letting things fall if i could afford to do that you know what i mean like the best would be if like you know if i had done some animation thing or i'd had something set up where i was like okay i'm okay i can just work on the comic for a while and then as soon as that's done you know it's like oh i got to deal with all this stuff that's piled up um but i always tried to i the rule was a page a week, but that was always getting broken. <laughs> but then at a certain point, like, all those things that you mentioned fell away, right? And I didn't want them in my life. And so then by the time the pandemic started, which I was planning on, like, I really just want to get to this book, I moved to another country, <laughs> and I didn't have anything going on, and I really got into a routine for two years. And it was, it, you know, starting it was like, it felt impossible. It felt, and I'm sure everyone here has had that experience. Where you're just like, this is never going to happen. There's no. <laughs> it just felt impossible, and it was just like, you know, one of those things. Where you're just like, I'm just gonna crawl my way through it. And I never, I, I never placed it with a, I hadn't placed it with a publisher. I never wanted to. I just didn't want that baggage. But my sense was like, just gotta keep pushing on it. But all that stuff was bullshit. You know, not bullshit. I'm glad I did Kramer's, but it, it, to do something like that takes, you've been involved in a lot of collaborative things. It takes a lot to do it right. And you, um, and I think the benefit of it was that it made me, um, it was a joy to sort of immerse myself in good comics and to feel like I loved all this stuff and it would sort of fuel me a little bit. But really, at the end of the day, it's like going forward. Now that the comic's done, like, yeah, I don't want to. I'm not going to do Kramer's. I'm not going to. You know, I've got something. I did a a little anthology thing with Stephen Weissman that's coming out that he wanted to do. Um, so I was helping him with that, and so we edited that together. It's a comics mag, just one issue. Um, but yeah, like I think it's too difficult. When you're younger, it's probably easier. But the kind of comic, like I'm not, I'm not. You know, I remember. There's just people who can make comics very quickly and they're very good at like doing a full day job, you know, and then jumping in and, and doing a page or whatever. But for me, the only method that really yields good work is I have to kind of cut everything out. And if that means like, even if like I have to do paying work, if it's just for two months, you know what I mean? Then I would rather do that and not try to like balance all this stuff just because my it's just my own method it's like i need to feel dead i need to feel like my life is over that i have <laughs> that my no I, I don't i don't think about career i don't think about any sort of stuff you know you got to kill all that and then it's then it's just like the only thing that like you need to feel like you're retired you know, and then I like really like if you're a retired person and you're like everything's oh, like a retired person, you think about it, you're like they're not stressed about their their career or their art life. They're just like I like to tend my garden, and if you if that's your relationship to your practice, then as soon as you can just add the thing of everything behind me is great, right? Which is very hard. If you just say everything behind me is great, you're not going to dwell on it because if you're used to having anxiety and stressing about work, you're not going to dwell on it being good. So you're like, that was great. Great, that's great. And then you just go like, the only thing that matters is this page. And then making dinner and walking the dog or whatever, whatever those handful of things are, it's pretty good. So if I can keep doing that, that's what I would like to do. Do you but, miss doing all the stuff though? No, you know, family was amazing. The theater I wasn't really involved in. And that's why that whole thing like, became a big clusterfuck because I wasn't heavily involved in that thing, right? Um, the store was great. I loved 
doing the bookstore because I loved supporting mini comics and small press authors and doing all that was so awesome. I loved it. But having a studio upstairs just meant I never got any, I got so little work done, you know, because it's a full time, if you're committed, I mean, I feel like a good store is only as good as the people who are running it and are committed to it. And when you're younger, you think that's, it's going to exist forever. And then when you realize at a certain point, like, no, they really exactly, they last like 10 years, like a great store. Quimby's is very unique, you know, but most stores cannot, if someone comes in, they have crazy energy, they're committed to it. And then at a certain point they burn out or they're so broke and they're just like, I just need to move on. But there are those beautiful retailers, we, you know, who, who stick around and are great at it, you know. Um, you have a answer? great uh, a persona- personality for making, for editing Kramers, because you could somehow ask people it's a, to do, it, it, it seems like. A, asking people all the I, time. It probably, to do feel, I can, Im- like, um, and this, you picked this lettering, or the font, and you. Uh, and this, this part, remember? Told you. <laughs> no, we changed. Uh, I changed it. Oh, okay. Anyway, yes, yes, you get credit. Um, the uh, the well, the point of the lettering was you had seen that lettering somewhere, and you wrote the editor asking what the lettering. You got them to send you the font, mm-hmm. and I was like, only Sammy could do that. No, oh. I would never. I would never be like, oh, I like this. I'm gonna email Sammy and ask him. Because it, it, I felt like that's like an editing mind. And I'm sure they were happy. And they were like, yeah. like the, 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 it's, it's something where you can be like, we're putting together this cool thing. And it's a very um, important thing, especially in comics, because I, it just seems like so many people are like, I don't know if anyone cares. or It, it, it needs like an added enthusiasm of we're, we're, we're making an awesome book here. You know, mm-hmm. um, so everyone uh, also everyone is ma- is like you told me flattered to be asked. So it's not you're you're it's, it's not it's, tough, it's not annoying. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it is tough. It's I mean, t- it's tough it to must... ask for people and you, you wish you, there was more money. Like, I don't think page rates have gotten better in like 30 years. It's probably gotten worse. If you see page. what Fano was paying for an anthology in the 80s, it's a lot better than now. And then I was like, you know, it, I feel like the thing, if, if the way to do an anthology would be like, if I could figure out interesting distribution and something that paid cartoonists. So the thing that me and Weissman are doing, it's being distributed by a clothing brand who wanted mm. to fund it. But I'm like, that'll go out into some weird world. The comic <laughs> fans who want it will, will order it. But the page rate was good, that we could offer that. And that's only because they're not trying to make money off the cover. You know what I mean? Like if they... Otherwise, it'd be like a $50 book if you're having a good page rate and trying to, and it's 50 people. I, I remember figuring, anyway, finding, I think tough. I asked um, Charles tough. Burns or someone the page rate for a heavy metal magazine comic, you yeah. know, in like the late 80s, early 90s. And it wasn't that much. It was low. Oh, really? And I thought, and I found it like weirdly, uh, um, invigorating because i was like <laughs> they drew all of that because you look at that and they're like and it's like of course they like hatch that whole weird mountain because they want it to right you know right right. they right, like right. figured out that city full of motorcycles yeah it wasn't for the money right right you know and it like made me kind of look at the whole thing different like like now i know like this could be in mome if the people wanted to draw like that right you know? right yeah anyway. Uh, I yeah. think that's. Can I ask you a question? Oh, yeah. Just about some older books, unless somebody else did. No, uh, no. I, I remember uh, when I discovered your stuff, I read Body World and Bottomless Belly Button very close back to back. So I'm sorry, this is like kind of a question about stuff you did a long, long time ago. But looking back, I often wonder uh, with those two books in particular, I kind of felt like there was some gutsy conceits to stay committed to. You know, across the span of a whole story, and I know one was kind of, I mean, uh, I felt like Body World, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was uh, conceived for Tumblr, right, to be kind of read. It was before down. Tumblr. Weirdly, it was on my site. It was before Tumblr, yeah. But it was one, you know, the computer screen's one long scroll down. How do you, how do you know you're going to commit to either something like that or, say, making one character in a family a frog? Like, what, what makes you feel 
what makes you trust like an impulse like that to kind of see it through for a whole story? Um, the the that long thing is I remember thinking for both of those books this uh, I this is this could be I could be making this is my memory of it is like uh this sounds so stupid I don't know any way other way to say it <laughs> I was like the pan, I was like the panel is the most important thing like don't think about pages or it's like panel 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 and then years later did you see this there was like a uh in the beginning of some um of this great um breakdown press uh reprint of a japanese comic the man next door man next door um uh he was the cartoonist was like this is co-manga, this is panel manga. It's about the panel. And I was like, oh, I understand completely. Uh, because I didn't want to think about any other thing. I didn't want to think about, I just was like, I'm just going to follow what the characters are doing panel by panel. And uh, I thought it was a really good way to go. And I still kind of think it was very, um, um, because then it's about the character. It's like, I'm going to follow what the character does. And the characters, most of those were like the characters drawn at the same angle, the same thing. Mm. And so it's just very easy to read. And on the computer screen, it was very easy to read. And then when it was transformed into a difficult to hold object. <laughs> um, but the, the um, so that was that. And the, you know, the frog thing, it was, there were lots of, um, the I, the conceit of that was that it kind of felt like an autobio comic, um, but it had too many characters to be autobio, and was from too many different characters' point of views to be autobio. And then mm. there were a bunch of autobio comics around that time or before where a character, where someone drew themselves in as an animal. There would, where Jason drew himself as a bird, or or there was some other. It, it kind of seemed like a trope, um, and uh, so I thought, well, this would be that because other characters are drawn a little differently from each other yeah. and but it all kind of looks like it um, is one so I thought well that character draws himself that way um, hmm. and uh, it wasn't supposed to be more me or anything it was just um, and for some reason it seemed uh, people usually mention it on for that book um, that was it <laughs> yeah Cool. Anything else? All done. We'll start signing a book for whoever wants one. Yeah. Thanks so Let's much, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.